Welcome all for the seventh edition of the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society Young Professionals and the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing Student Consortium Summer School. Well, this year we will have webinars, roundtables, and tutorials with hands on. And these editions is organized actually by two Santa Catarina State Universities. Budesk and Uno Chapeco. This event is supported by two scientific societies, the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society and the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and their student branch, the Young Professional Wand and the Student Consortium. We welcome you all to visit our main page and to answer actually the quiz with some particularities of the Santa Catarina state and the southern part of Brazil country. And also the welcome words of the two presidents of the two scientific societies and our rectors. This event is also supported by our state foundation, FAPESCI, and two private companies, Geoassessoria Canoinhas and Instituto Gilson Volpato de Educação Científica. Our partners for promoting these events are different institutions and universities in Brazil. And so far, we have delivered six webinars, two roundtables, and two tutorials. Today, we will have a special talk with Dr. Margaret Maiden from the University of Georgia. And we also invite you for this Thursday with Dr. Daya Sagar for another webinar entitled Mathematical Morphology and Processing and Analysis of Digital Elevation Models. For November 18th, global uh, tutorial with hands-on entitled Global Vegetation Trend, a multi-decade planetary coverage and analysis ready product with Dr. Leandro Parenti. And then on November 23, SAR, SAR polarimetry and multi-temporal SAR statistical descriptions with Dr. Carlos Lopez Martinez from Spain. Well, for today webinars, I will just invite Professor Eliana Lima da Fonseca. She is associate professor at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, and her expertise is actually on vegetation and remote sensing. So, Eliana, please feel free to introduce our moderators for today's sessions and also our distinguished lecture. Thank you, Veraldo. Uh, hello, everyone. I welcome, welcome to this session. Uh, I would uh, like to introduce my Brazilian colleagues, Professor Fabio Brenwink from UFSM, and Dr. Ricardo Dallagnol from INPE. Uh, we share this uh, moderation. And I would uh, like to introduce uh, Dr. Marguerite Madden from University of Georgia in the United States. She is professor and director uh, of the Center of Geospatial Research. She works with GIS science and landscape ecology applied to biological and physical process. And she works also with uh, human animal impacts on the environment. Uh, professor Margaret, welcome. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It is an honor uh, to have you here to share your knowledge with us. The table is all yours, please. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm very excited to be a part of this summer school. Um, I'll go ahead and, and share my screen.
and maximize my presentation. Okay. Okay, so how does that look? Very good. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction, Elena. Um, uh, I'd like to talk today about a project that I just love. Um, we've been working on it for about four years, I think. And uh, basically geospatial analysis to mitigate human elephant conflict in Southern Africa. And um, there's, we're, I'm actually part of a research group so I'd love to um, just acknowledge my colleagues um, and also the Research Council of Zimbabwe for our permit to do the research and their support. Um, we represent um, a few different universities in the United States and also an NGO, Connected Conservation, and another NGO, the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust. Um, both are very, um, actively involved in putting GPS collars on bull elephants. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, but also um, uh, US Forest Service and other parks uh, within Zimbabwe. So um, Connected Conservation is the NGO that has been supporting uh, buying the GPS collars, collecting the data, doing a lot of the, the groundwork. Um, so you could go to their, um, or their website and meet everybody. Um, Malvern Cardozo in the upper left corner, he lives in Victoria Falls and he is the person um, the um, Zimbabwe parks will call when there's a problem. And there are a lot of problems with bull elephants. And especially after COVID, because of lockdown and there's uh, many more wild um, animals are going into uh, populated areas. We think because there's few fewer tourists, um, just people are staying inside more and the wildlife are just, um, you know, coming into developed areas more often. Um, William Langbauer is a specialist um, in elephant behavior and especially he helped to um, identify uh, infrasound communication with elephants. So I'll be talking about that. Andrea Presoto was my uh, PhD student and you might be able to tell she's from Brazil originally. She's now an associate professor at the University of Salzburg in um, Salisbury in Maryland. Um, myself and Loki Osborne, Dr. Loki Osborne, he lives in Cape Town, Africa. Um, he heads the Connected Conservation. So he and Malvern are our, our people in Zimbabwe. And then um, there's an excellent group of, of local uh, researchers and um, field attendants. And then Roger Perry is our um, veterinarian who does the darting and the hard work of, of uh, putting the elephants to sleep so we can put the collars on. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge my research group at the Center for Geospatial Research, the University of Georgia in the Department of Geography, and especially right in the center, Dr. Sergio Bernardes, who you might tell is also from Brazil originally. Um, and he is the Associate Director um, of CGR. And met much of the work I'll be showing is his research. So I really want to acknowledge his, his uh, contributions. So my objectives today, um, our research is to understand elephant movements and linkages to development, local communal farming and drought or other climate impacts towards mitigating. And mitigating means really lessening or trying to remove human elephant conflict in Africa. Um, our work combines geospatial technologies of remote sensing photogrammetry and geovisualization. And we analyze spatial temporal patterns of animal movements and habitat condition that we hope ultimately aids decision makers, such as the resource managers from the national parks, 
um, the managers of game reserves, um, developers, uh, local government officials, local tribal members um, who are representing the, um, uh, the interests of the communal um, tribal lands and also subs subsistence farmers. So um, just a note before I begin, um, I know your, your summer school is very involved with exciting um, research in uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, um, machine learning, all kinds of automation, which we absolutely need to be able to um, process and understand and manage the fire hose of data that we have now. But I'd also like you to remember always the power of visualization and that seeing is believing and understanding. Um, so in order to understand our imagery, the processing and the products of our geospatial analyses from basic image enhancement and classification to feature extraction and um, advanced algorithms in, in deep learning, um, we really need to understand the image features before we process and, and during and after processing. Um, the image interpretation is critical to assess the quality of the output. And I would like you all to remember that we each bring our life experiences, our perceptions, our values, where we live, anywhere we travel, the books we've read, um, uh, our own personal experiences to our computer screens and we have amazing brains so we can we can filter we can understand the imagery um, and then we need to to bring that into our algorithms and try to uh, replicate what we're doing in our thoughts when we're analyzing and viewing the images so the motivation for our research um, is uh, uh, many factors, but one especially is climate change and drought in Africa. Um, uh, we are seeing a shift in the, the dry season, wet season, the periodicity, when the rains begin seem to be later. Um, the dry season seems to be prolonged. Um, sometimes the rains don't even come, such as in 2019, um, there was a tremendous drought and that affects people their livelihoods, agriculture, their food security, and also the, the habitat for wildlife. So you can imagine it just drives wildlife into agricultural areas. Um, it also caused um, a, a, a tremendous elephant dieback in 2019. And actually there were over 300 elephants killed, especially in Botswana. Um, and a theory is that the water uh, holes dry up, very hot. There's a lot of growth of algae and cyanobacteria um, uh, produce neurotoxins that kill elephants and people and livestock. Um, and we lost, we definitely lost some of our, our bull elephants, um, we believe, to cyanobacteria. So I'd um, like to just um, uh, give you a little background that uh, there, our work today builds on prior studies and especially like to acknowledge Dr. Richard Bear Hoskin, who was a large animal veterinarian um, at our university. And very early on in the mid 1990s, he put GPS collars on dyads of, of um, female and, and their, their calves um, to track their movements. He was involved in research looking at artificial, um, I'm sorry, um, sterilization of elephants because the elephants in Kruger National Park were overpopulated and the way they controlled them is with culling, which is, is having professional hunters kill all of the elephants in a family group in order to keep the population within their carrying capacity. Um, it's a very, very drastic measure um, the alternative is to have um, elephants overpopulated and starving. So um, the culling was just just um, a horrible, but uh, maybe sometimes necessary management technique. Um, so he was trying sterilization instead. There was criticism that the, the mothers would not take care of their babies, but we had the GPS um, data to show that the mothers and the babies stayed together at all times. Um, 
so so he he laid the groundwork for this research and then um dr andrea persoto i met her when we went to brazil to study capuchin monkeys and their behavior using tools to crack palm nuts um, this happens in um, the Cerrado, a very dry area. Just fascinating, um, her research is fascinating. She needed to follow the, the monkeys because they're too small to really put uh, GPS collars on them um, and they, they didn't want to. So they, they, she followed the, the monkeys. She did research on um, cognition, spatial cognition and navigation techniques. And then she decided that was her PhD work um, she decided to get a second PhD. So she came from Sao Paulo and joined us and she used the elephant data to compare um, their movements and their behavior with the monkey behavior um, related to habitat conditions. So um, her, her articles are fascinating if you want to um, look. And at the end of the, this talk, I have um, cite her citations. Um, I had a master's student also looking at the same um, elephant data in Cougar National Park and um, her work is cited here and she was looking at um, core areas and how they navigate differently when they um, uh, move to a new area and they're in an area they don't know. So there's two different um, methods of navigation called um, uh, allo and um, egocentric uh, navigation. So um, this work also builds on our um, long history of doing vegetation inventories, mapping at high details, um, dating back to my work dates back to the 1970s, but here in Georgia in the 1990s, um, and really drilling in um, uh, and mapping vegetation from aerial imagery at a very high level of detail. These are two national parks in the United States. Um, and then more recently, we've been using drones and um, structure for motion or um, multi-image matching um, to create a very fine um, scale 3D point clouds and ortho mosaics and digital surface models combined with multi-spectral sensors. Um, very low cost systems. We use DJI quadcopters um, with the uh, microsense sensor strapped on and this is the work of Sergio Bernardez. So I hope you look up his work as well. Um, uh, we've done some work here at the University of Georgia, creating 3D models, um, also virtual and augmented reality, um, which uh, I think is the geovisualization has um, uh, a part to play in especially science communication and outreach and excitement in uh, science education. So um, we brought this around to our study. Um, this is, um, we can bring up a, um, digi a, a, a virtual reality 3D model of cities and um, display on our video wall and have multiple headsets of augmented reality in the Microsense, um, sorry, the, um, the Microsoft um, uh, augmented reality goggles. So, um, Coming to this research, uh, we're centered on an area where five countries come together. This is called the Kavango Zambezi Trans Transfrontier Conservation Area. It's kind of a mouthful, so we call it CASA. Um, and uh, our study is centered on Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe. So it's a very famous wonder of the world, um, a tourist destination a sacred place for um, tribal groups that uh, live there, have lived there traditionally. Um, and just to orient you, so um, this area is considered Southern Africa. And if we zoom into Zimbabwe, um, it's really where um, uh, Zambia and Botswana and Namibia come together and meet Zimbabwe in the, in the horn of Zimbabwe. And if we zoom in, um, this is a Zambezi River and you begin to see, um, you can see where the falls are. Um, the lighter colored area, those are very small um, fields. Um, this is the communal lands and this is subsistence farming for the most part. And at the, the south end is uh, the airport. So just to, to orient you and there are national parks and game reserves in this area. And then to zoom into Victoria Falls, it's 
not a very big city. Um, it's actually very small and you can see in the north part, uh, it's very green. So this is an area with um, gardens and irrigation and a lot of fruit trees and water that um, the elephants will be attracted to, um, especially during the dry season. There's a small commercial area right in the center where that red marker is. And then to the south, there's been expansion of residential uh, growth. And to the west, you can see some new roads that have been laid out. And this is an area of future development as well. In the very, very bottom, you see a, a little dark uh, area. This is the water treatment plant and the, um, uh, the, the dump site where all of the, the waste um, is gathered. And this is also an attraction for um, elephants. Um, so this is a, the kind of the study area that I'll be talking about. So um, the conflict, um, there are many, many different kinds of conflict. And it is uh, um, a bull elephants or the male elephants that are our big problem. Um, they are kicked out of their family groups when they're teenagers. And um, they're upset. They don't know what to do. Their hormones are raging. Um, they tend to band together with other male elephants, other bulls. So say from the age of about 15 or 16 years old until uh, maybe they're 45 years old, their strategy is to eat as much as they can and grow and get as big as they can so that they can challenge the big bulls who live in um, mostly the national parks and are breeding with the family groups. Um, so you can imagine the lush vegetation and agricultural fields as a, an attraction. They can come into a field and remove the veg all the crop in one night, take the entire year salary of a farmer and destroy it in one night. So typically they would, they would kill the, the problem animal. Um, they butcher the animal, they share the meat, um, every part is used, but there'll be another elephant coming behind them or another family group. Um, so it's really not solving the problem. Also, they come into town, um, uh, they do attack people, they have killed people. And in fact, in the last month, I know of three people who have been killed in Zimbabwe uh, in our study area alone. Not by our elephants, thank goodness, um, but um, it'll be sometimes it'll be a female protecting um, the, the little ones. Tourists get too close. Um, the bulls are very unpredictable and there's a lot of interesting information about um, uh, the psychology of bulls that have experienced um, the culling and the violence when they were very young, um, not being raised in a family social structure, also not being around older bulls. And um, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of hormonal um, feedback that keeps them from being coming aggressive. And when they don't have that, their period of it's called must um, last longer and they're more aggressive and um, more brazen. So this is one of our bulls, bull number two. He's walking down um, the center street in Victoria Falls. You can see the GPS unit behind his ears on the top of his head. He's a big bull and there's one in front of him. So we, we call her number two early on and um, He's on his third GPS caller now, so we're continuing to track him. Um, so um, this issue has been there for a while, but um, Andrea really, um, Andrea Persoto brought a number of us together. We started having Skype calls in the beginning, and then we were able to go to Victoria Falls in 2017, 2018, and 2019. Unfortunately, not in 2020 and not this year but we hope to go back as soon as um, you know, we're able to because of the pandemic. So um, it's an excellent group of researchers who are working with local guardians um, who are liaison between the local tribes, the communal, communal tribes and um, the researchers and natural resource managers. So we have collared 17 bulls to date. Um, the first year we went there, um, we were ready and trained to go out to help with the collaring. 
but um, the President Mugabe came to Victoria Falls and we could not continue. Um, there are no uh, helicopters or, or um, there was restrictions on our movements. So we left, but as soon as we left in early September, they were able to collar five bulls. The next year, five more. Um, the following year, um, you can see uh, there was one lion that was collared and with one of our GPS units. And then in 2019, we had another five. And then more just recently, we've had uh, four more. So we've been able to afford to get about five GPS collars at a time. Each one costs about $4,000. Um, but we have entered into a, a, another project, uh, a continuation of our project, which we call disruptive darting research. And so the last uh, four, and then we had actually there have been five because bull two has been recolored, um, have all had a, a treatment um, with, with chili wax. So I'll be describing that in just a moment. Um, you can see some of these are grayed out and they are the bulls, unfortunately, who have died. Um, some from poaching, some from cyanobacteria toxicity, um, some the collars, one collar just fell off, um, and then also the batteries going dead. So we, we can still locate them using triangulation, um, and um, there's a radio signal that is given off. We just don't have the GPS points, but we do um, dart the elephants and take the, el the, the collar off when the batteries run out. So when I was there in, in 2019, um, we were trying to find a bull elephant, but um, they found a lion instead. So they asked if we could um, use one of the collars. And so this is a lioness. So that was exciting. The lion was nearby and there was also an elephant nearby. So we stayed in, in our cars, but then we were able to come out. And um, I sent a text to my brothers and sisters, said we put a GPS collar on a lion today but don't tell mom. Um, we track our elephant movements um, using an app on our cell phones. So when we're there, we're able to bring up um, the collar of particular bulls and see where they're located. We can drive and try to find them. So we've been able to locate, especially bull two quite often. He uh, circles Victoria Falls, sometimes goes into town, um, so we can, we can re and then we can recover the GPS tracks as well to bring them into GIS. Um, and um, one thing we have noted is that they do very often go to the dump site. They eat garbage. Um, there was not a very good fence around it for a while. Now they do have an electric fence, um, but electricity, just uh, supplying electricity to the fence is an issue. They definitely drink water from the water treatment plants here and also in Livingston in Zambia. Um, so they are um, eating garbage. And um, this was a, a, an image uh, Malvern took um, of their dung, which you can see the plastic is mixed in. So they are ingesting plastic, batteries, wire, broken glass, um, herbicides, fertilizer, chemicals, they have very, very strong guts, and a lot of this is processed through their digestive system, but it also perforates their, um, uh, their inner organs sometimes and leads to toxicity and death. So we just were curious um, how much plastic they might be ingesting. So we just took, this is um, Sergio, did this, Sergio Bernardez. He took the image and brought it into um, Envy to do a segmentation uh, supervised classification to merge um, similar um, objects and classify them into dung, um, soil that had been processed, and dung, sorry, that had been processed by dung beetles, um, the color of different plastics, the soil, and the vegetation. And just a, a quick analysis found that almost 40% of this particular dung pile is made of plastic. So there's a substantial amount being ingested um, and then actually carried away from the dump and then redistributed throughout the environment. Um, some research of, of Dr. Langbauer, he's interested in the, the, record, the sounds that elephants made. So he has um, swift units, which are recording um, all kinds of wildlife sounds, but especially the, the very low frequency infrasound vocalizations that we cannot hear 
um, with our, our ears. But if you speed up the recording, you can hear them. And he did work with um, um, uh, Janice Poole and Katie Payne early on, Cynthia Moss, and um, they, they were able to determine with experimentation that there are particular calls that the, especially the, the cow, the female elephants are sending out when they are in heat. Um, they, it takes them, um, it, they're four years, you know, really uh, raising their calves. And when they are ready to breed again, um, they, um, they emit a particular frequency and, and pattern of sounds and bull elephants will, 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 will be able to pick that up um, because it travels very far distances in the soil. Um, so you can um, read about, about her work. Uh, Katie Payne is at the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And I'll just run this. Um, this will switch to a YouTube video. Dear, uh, dear Margaret, I think we are all the, the background team will protect the video from your food. <laughs> Great, Veraldo has replaced your presentations by the the video. I think was the sound was a little bit better. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Please feel free to continue to your presentation. Sorry, okay. <laughs> sorry, right. sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> um, let me get back to where I was. I'm just enlarging my screen again. Okay. So, so I guess you, you heard the vocalizations of the elephants. Um, and also we do have a problem with the swift units because the elephants often will knock down the trees and we have to recover the units. Um, so, um, so this is some uh, work we're, we're starting on now. Okay. I also um, have the data available to the classes that I teach. So um, I teach a, a, a course called Aerial Photographs and Image Analysis. And so they can use the data for their projects. Um, they uh, classify the land use and land cover and vegetation types. They look at um, the home ranges of the elephants um, comparing different elephants, different ages. Um, they look at the land uses that the elephants are, are moving in. Um, they compare um, different vegetation conditions, also looking at vegetation indices and comparing their movements um, and their use of the habitats in the dry seasons and the wet seasons. Um, this one is interesting if you look at the blue dots which is um our elephant number four he got caught behind a fence for many months and had a, had trouble finding out how to get out eventually he did on the backside, and he was able to be free again 
Um, in the wet season, we tend to see the distribution is more wide and spread out because there's more food available all over in the dry season. They're really looking for um, wet areas and wetlands and, and sources of water. So, um, and uh, this is just a quick animation um, to show the dry season, going to the river quite a bit, um, and also seeking some more uh, cooler temperatures. And then in the wet season, um, that's when the crops are available. So they'll go to the crops and raid them um, and their, their distribution is much wider. Uh, this, this term, I'm teaching a first year Odyssey class, which is uh, first year students. Um, the, uh, the course is meant to introduce students to uh, professors who are doing research. So I've assigned each of the students a particular bull and um, they're looking at their bull's movements and then also um, related to uh, a second bull. They're looking at wet and dry season movements and they're using Google Earth um, Pro. Uh, I'll be introducing them to QGIS and also ArcGIS Pro. So it's an introduction to GIS and a little bit of remote sensing and um, some geospatial, uh, especially geovisualization of the GPS tracking data. Um, Andrea has done a lot of work with um, uh, identifying corridors and repeated segments for um, uh, habitat use. And she's, she's published some of this in Animal Behavior. She has a program that she distributes called HARM, which is the habitual route analysis method available on GitHub. Um, she's compared um, different primates and we have um, also some re researchers here looking at gorilla movement um, compared to the elephant movement. So that might be a handy tool if you're interested in looking at corridor analysis. Um, we're identifying these corridors and our idea is to um, uh, have developers who are thinking about um, developing and adding new residential areas to be mindful of where the elephants are, are moving. And so can they relocate that hotel or that new residential area and avoid conflict um, in their development plans? Um, and also we um, did a little bit of um, 3D visualization. And I like this because it shows the different elephants and whether they're overlapping in time as well as space. Um, you can look at regular patterns of movement um, and when they decide to take off and go to different places. Um, so I have some, um, uh, some uh, groups in the statistics department looking at this data. Um, so the mitigation, to get into the mitigation, um, our researchers, especially Dr. Osborne and, um, and, and Malvern uh, Cordozo, have been uh, teaching and, or, or developing methods to use chili peppers um, to extract oils and also make a mash out of them. Um, you can see the fences around the agricultural fields are mostly made of, of natural materials, very easy for the elephants to break through um, and trample the crops. Um, so um, they have provided uh, families with um, the chili pepper plants. Each family has a row that they tend and they can harvest, make the mash, um, and they can also um, uh, sell the chili if they want to. Um, but they can use the, um, the oils. Um, they've uh, found the best method is to insert the oil into a ping pong ball. And then they use um, homemade uh, potato launcher basically to shoot the ping pong balls at night at the elephants when they come to the fields. The ping pong ball breaks and the oils in the air are sucked into their trunks. Um, the trunks are very, very sensitive and it burns. Um, as you can imagine, any kind of pepper spray does. So um, they, will, they will run away from the fields, but we don't really know how long do they stay away? Do they come back in a week? Um, do they avoid these for long periods of time? Um, so we're interested in tracking their movements before and after this kind of a mitigation um, uh, application. Um, we, we also are using chili wax now. So um, our bull number two was at a school. He was at the Baobab Primary School. 
um, during the afternoon when um, uh, parents were there to pick up the children and there were some fruit trees that he and some of his friends were trying to get off the trees. So it was a, a fairly tense situation. So um, the, uh, the Zim Parks uh, rangers or resource managers called Malvern. He went there, he and Roger Perry, they darted number two and they rubbed chili wax um, in his trunk and uh, mouth and very sensitive areas. Um, that was in uh, on July 20th of 2018. The next day he went north of Victoria Falls. Um, the day after that, he went around the city and then he has come back to Victoria Falls, but he's never come closer than for a long time. It was 500 meters of the mitigation, mitigation site. And now he's come as close as 250 meters. But this is three years afterwards. He has not gone back to the, the elementary school. So we're trying to see how effective this is. Um, we started the disruptive darting um, program about a year ago. Uh, there was another elephant that was going onto the airport runway. And you can imagine that's a dangerous situation. He had broken through the fence. He was also raiding crops um, in the woodlands community nearby. And then, um, so um, they were able to dart him and put a collar on him and put the chili wax on him. Um, and we've been uh, tracking his movements since then. So in the daytime, he tends, tends to stay within a game refuge area. And then at night, he ventures out to drink and raid the crops. Um, so um, we've been, uh, he has not gone back to the airport. So we're trying to see how long this will be effective. And we've actually been able to um, collar a bull 16 and just last week a 17 and an 18. So um, so we're collecting data. One of the one of the bulls we had the collar on him and then he um, was able to be darted after that and waxed. So we have some movement behavior before and after the mitigation. Um, so um, they're just very uh, used to people. This elephant is just coming up and knocking over the garbage and eating it. Um, and this elephant um, comes close and, you know, just they're, they're not afraid of people. In fact, this is bull 16. We think he might have even been uh, um, from a wildlife area where he's used to people. So, um, so yeah, it, it can be a dangerous situation. Um, and I'll just go ahead. Um, I'll just go into move into some future work to end my presentation. Um, we uh, have flown a little bit of drone imagery there. We would like to fly imagery of the crops before and after uh, a raiding event to try to uh, quantify the uh, amount of damage, the loss of crops. Um, I have a uh, we've had some research, and this was a, a master student of mine looking at small gardens and a lot of detail using drone imagery and structure from motion to develop uh, 3D models and to um, measure uh, volume of the crops um, to try to look at, um, she was looking at the growth of the crops, but it can also be damage after the crop is removed. Um, another thing we're interested in, and this was um, Dr. Langbauer's idea is to take pictures of their footprints because elephants uh, pads are like our, our fingerprints. There's a unique uh, pattern of cracks. And so every time we dart an elephant to put the GPS collar on, we take pictures of the four feet. And um, the idea maybe eventually would be if we found tracks in a field that we would be able to identify what particular elephant it was, um, because sometimes there'll be a, an elephant um, that has raided a crop and then a, another random elephant is killed and it may not be the same one that was, was causing the problems. Um, and there has been some work done on this, um, especially looking at the shape of the, of the footprints. And this is done by Wild Track Group um, they, they look at all kinds of wildlife footprints, which is really interesting. But we're mostly interested in, instead of the shape, actually looking at the patterns of the, of the, um, the cracks. 
And I think this is a perfect um, example of using deep learning to identify spatial patterns. Um, so in addition to the disruptive darting with the chili wax, we are also looking at home ranges, overlapping ranges. Um, Dr. Prisoto is looking at a landscape of fear. So how close do they come to human activity, uh, roads, uh, places of conflict? Um, I have two PhD students looking at the imagery now. Um, Kate Markham is um, looking at time series and mapping vegetation in a higher level of detail. She's looking at locations of conflict um, and using machine learning or developing machine learning models to predict crop rating. Um, and then Molly Azami is also looking at transboundary crossings um, because the elephants obviously don't know about borders, but management can be very different from one country to another. Um, so we, we'd like to look at um, drivers of, of moving large distances and then um, uh, their, their use of home ranges. Another experiment we might be trying is looking at other deterrents and in the crop area, um, looking at uh, rubbing the chili on fences other smelly potions, shiny things, um, fences, and a control. Um, and this is an area where there are some elephants that are being rewild. They were used for elephant rides, but now they're in a reserve area. So we may be able to set up an experiment and videotape their, um, their behavior. Their sounds can give you some indication of um, a sound score of how alarmed they are, or do they get habituated very quickly? Um, how much of a deterrent would this be, and would it be um, useful to the to the farmers? So, just in conclusion, our our climate is obviously changing. There's more and more development, more people, need for food um, and agriculture, um, but um, our changing climate is causing a loss of um, and loss of food security, displacing people, and increasing human wildlife conflicts worldwide. Um, so I would say all of your research is critical. We need accurate, efficient, and operational extraction of two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional information from imagery. Um, this information needs to be open access. We need to have online processing and um, dissemination of the output products and to really be able to um, share our research and, and have it be useful and applied. Um, but I would just help, hope you remember to trust your eyes and your brain to understand imagery, interpret the success of your geospatial analyses, and, and really um, explore um, machine learning and deep learning. Um, we hope that, um, that what all of you are learning in your classrooms, the concepts, the theories, the, the exercises that you do are uh, moved into your own research um, to develop new algorithms, to create and refine um, workflows, and then apply um, for um, applications really for our um, societal benefit um, to help local communities and influence um, good decisions in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, just uh, if you are interested in some of our research that's been published, the last slide has the citations. So um, that's the end of my, uh, and I'll stop with my screen. <laughs> oh, thank you, Margaret, for your Thank you, Marguerite, for um, sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, we have some questions for the audience and for the other moderators and for myself as well. Uh, first, uh, I would like to ask if it is possible monitoring the elephant hoax using only remote sensing images or GPS is essential for this monitoring. Uh, in, in fact, the question is, if the elephants made some uh, trails that can we identify uh, at remote sensing image? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I always like 
to combine ground truth with remote sensing. Um, I like to go there myself, but the next best thing is to have people there. You can ask questions and the tracks of the elephants just really give you that, um, that grounding, I guess, you know, in what are the elephants doing. Um, uh, we've also looked at um, the number of GPS um, recording or, or locations. Many um, uh, GPS units are collecting one point per day, sometimes one every 12 hours. We have done every hour, and then we've also tried every 15 minutes. So really trying to experiment with some of that. Um, I, I think that really helps us to learn what's going on. And then um, you can broaden your perspective and look at other areas, um, build your models, and then see how robust they are in other areas. Um, the trails are definitely used by all kinds of wildlife. So you really wouldn't know if it's just elephants. I mean, there are rhinoceroses, you know, there are giraffes, zebras, um, all kinds of wildlife use those trails. Um, if you are flying drone imagery, you can see the elephants. Um, uh, and there's definitely been aerial surveys of the elephants themselves. It's interesting that elephants are very afraid of bees. So the drone in, uh, sound will scare the elephants because it sounds like bees. And so some have even experimented with using drones to try to herd the elephants and move them. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I guess that's kind of a long-winded uh, answer, but you could definitely use only the imagery if you're interested in, say, the vegetation condition, changes in uh, human impacts, so roads and development, um, clearings, agriculture, um, you know, water, water bodies, uh, remote sensing to try to detect the algae growth. We have some researchers here who are looking at that. Um, and so, you know, if you understand a system, you can definitely use remote sensing only. But the tracking and the movement uh, really brings the, the two together that, that I really like, like that work. Okay. Uh, we have some questions from uh, Fabio. Fabio, uh, could you read your question, the first one? Okay. 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 Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you for letting us know about such such information, very exciting presentation, dear Margaret. Uh, the question is about uh, how are, what are the major constraints to monitor the wildlife and how the other, the, I think that there are, there are teams from different knowledge areas, mm -hmm. how they accept such new technology, what they think about this new technology. Oh, okay. Um, so, so the constraints first. Um, I think ideally we have in our mind that we can create a wonderful spatial temporal data set. So we can, yes. we can put the collars on and track their movements and compare them. Um, but in any longitudinal study, you have gaps you have problems with the GPS not working. Yes. You have, oh, you know, battery issues, you know. So um, so we have 17 elephants that are, are collared, but there's not a, um, always an overlap between them. So we almost have them in cohorts of different years. Um, so so just trying to, to, you know, have a nice clean data set is, is sometimes a constraint. Um, and then the issue of the trade-off between the number of locations or recordings that are reported. So the callers will last longer if you don't uh, transmit them very often. Um, so when we're, uh, that's a debate within our, our team because Andrea wants a point every 15 minutes and the people who are putting the callers on, it's, it's a lot of work to, to find the bull, to make sure they doesn't run away to dart the bull, um, it can be dangerous. We've had we've had people attacked. Um, we had to kill one bull um, who was attacking um, a, a person in our team. And unfortunately, once he was killed, they found out he had an infection in his jaw, maybe from eating garbage. So um, so it's it's a lot of work to put the collars on and take them off. So that that is definitely a constraint. Um, other animals it may be a little bit easier, but. Um, um, so, so just you know, kind of those, those practical issues. 
Um, but our team is, um, it, it is interdisciplinary. So we have people who are, um, are more familiar with remote sensing and, and image processing and geocomputation. I would say um, our other team members who are um, very knowledgeable in, in elephant physiology and behavior and um, vegetation, um, they're all extremely excited and interested in the geospatial technologies um, analyses. Um, Malvern will sometimes send us a text and they'll say, um, I, I need to meet with some, some local people. Can you give me some maps? You know, and he'll ask for the maps and we try to respond as, as quickly as we can. Um, uh, another, um, actually it's uh, involved in with a constraint is that some of the data are, um, are sensitive. So um, we have some colleagues in Botswana and they don't want, they really cannot share the individual track data because the um, their their government is very cautious to let that out because of poaching. So um, you know, so that's another um, you know that's kind of a dilemma. You know, do we study their their movements and make this data available, and does that help people who are not they don't have good intentions also understand their behavior and where they're moving, and they can you know more easily access them. Um, uh, and lately, it's been killing with poison, and so that can affect uh, a lot of wildlife at one time. So, so uh, multidisciplinary teams are just, uh, that's, it's, it's so exciting and I'm really um, glad to be a part of, of this research group. Um, well, we have another questions. Uh, we have uh, one from Horai Martins Neto. Uh, Ricardo, could you read this? Sure. Um, so in Loblolly Pine Forest Plantations in Brazil, we have some conflicts with capuchin monkeys. Could you use this methodology to mitigate the human capuchin monkey conflict? Uh, that is, that is um, a very good question. Um, so uh, one thing is, it is may, there may be a little bit um, more difficult to uh, because they are so small, you know, you uh, you wouldn't want to dart them and rub them with chili wax. I wouldn't. <laughs> so you'd have to um, come up with a, a way of. Um, oh, I know. Oh, so one maybe if you if you had a, a fence around the area or something that they were uh, attracted to it, they got it on their hands. Somehow they got it in their mouth or something, or you know, burned on their skin. You know that that could be one thing. I was in Costa Rica one time um, at a sugar um, cane plantation and the farmer had an electric fence that was very low to the ground and he said that was for monkeys and I thought well they can just jump over it so it doesn't seem like that's keeping the monkeys out but he said well one will come over and they'll grab the fence they'll get the electric shock and they'll be very scared and vocalize and um, all the others will run away. So that was, you know, one thing. He also planted more sugar cane um, on the outside of his fields so that they would have something to eat and then they wouldn't get his crop. Um, so, um, yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, there's, there's uh, wildlife, you know, conflict. It's, it's, it's an issue in many, many places. Bears here in the United States, deer, you know, um, especially very smart animals like primates. You know, they learn very quickly, you know, that something is not really going to hurt them, you know, and they get a way around it. So, um, but I would definitely contact Andrea uh, about that because she worked with capuchin monkeys in the Atlantic rainforest um, in near Sao Paulo. And then also um, the, um, the capuchins in the Cerrado area. And, um, and so she's, she's pretty familiar with, uh, with the uh, capuchin um group behavior. So she would be a good person to contact. Good. Uh, and Ricardo, you have some questions uh, also if you can read. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first one is more of a curiosity, like do elephants just walk within the Victoria Falls city? And is that common in other countries in, in, in Africa? Like, I, I don't know anything about, about Africa. Yeah. yeah so that, that was amazing to me as well. So Victoria Falls is a city that's actually inside of a, of a national park. So the people, you know, have to kind of remember that, but they don't. 
So there's no fences and you're, you're really not allowed to, to fence the wildlife out. So, um, so based on the, the points that we see, their tracks, they come at night. Um, they will sometimes, um, I had one person tell me, they, they had a wall around their, their property. The elephant burst through the wall, drank water out of the pool, and then burst through the wall on the other side. Um, so another woman who lived there told me that, you know, we just opened the gate. We just let them in, they <laughs> drink, and then they can come out. Um, so, you know, in a way there's been, you know, um, people have been cohabitating habiting with elephants for a while. But um, in fact, just this week, a man who worked at um, a bar was walking home and he got too close to a, a female with some cows and, and he was killed. Um, so people are walking all the time in this area. And, you know, sometimes they just ignore you and sometimes they'll be aggressive. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, the observation recently of more and more um, lions, jaguar, um, uh, and also elephants being in town more than normal. And we think it's because of the lockdown and uh, fewer tourists and fewer people moving around. You know, they're kind of reclaiming their space almost and, and coming into town more often. Well, very interesting, very interesting. Um, uh, we have another question. Maybe Fabio, could you read it from Horai Martins? Okay. Okay. Horai, Horai Martins asked us to, what kind of machine learning method did you use to perform this, this analysis? Yes. Yeah. Analysis. So, um, so my, my students have just been looking at a couple different um, random forests seems to be the best, you know, it's, it's very good for classifying, um, but also for predictions. Um, and, and so one limitation and another constraint that we have is that there are not that many um, uh, points of conflict. So we do have, um, you know, uh, places where uh, crop raiding has taken place or there's been an attack by an elephant. Um, so we do have those locations, but you would really want a lot of points to be able to train and then save for verification of your models. So then we're, we're making assumptions. So we assume that when elephant tracks come within a certain distance of say an agricultural field or a um, residence or an airport or a, a water treatment plant, that that is a, a, an area of high potential conflict. So. Um, um, support vector machines work pretty well, um, um, but you know um, they you know they it, they tend to be similar, but but random forest is um, uh, outperforms the others. Okay, and um, um, Ricardo, could you read the question from Fabiana, please? Sure. Uh... Uh, would it be possible to share a few of the thoughts about the environmental policy and governmental efforts to keep the balance between preserving conservation units okay. and uh, environmental corridors and both agriculture and tourism activities? Yes. Oh, very good question. Um, and Victoria Falls just seems like the perfect place to do this because it does have... Um, you know, the tourism, the historical um, uh, importance, you know, worldwide, international attention. Um, hunting, hunting is a, a, you know, large game hunting is a, a big issue. You know, I had my Western thoughts about that. You know, we need to protect these wild animals and this is the last place where they live. And then when you go there, you realize what it's like to live with large animals and the danger of it, the, 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 um, young students who live in the communal areas, they can go to elementary school and primary school there, but they have to walk into Victoria Falls to go to high school. And it is a 10 kilometer walk. There's not a lot of um, public transportation, it's all dirt roads, it's hard to ride a bike. And so they are, you know, um, subject to buffalo and lions and, and elephants. Um, so it can be very dangerous. Um, there's a lot of um, attention and money being brought into the area to develop lodges and, and hotels 
and there's a big need for um, for uh, lodging because of conventions and um, big game um, uh, tourism where people come and pay a lot of money to eat at restaurants and stay in these hotels and be taken out into the bush either to hunt or to um, see wildlife. So um, a hunter might might pay $30,000 to come and to shoot one big bull who is very old and maybe, you know, challenged and, and killed anyway. Um, so local people are saying, well, if, I, if we can charge that much money and get money back into our national parks and protect our preserves, you know, is that a bad thing? Um, so, so, you know, I'm just wrestling. I'm wrestling with it all the time. But if we can identify the corridors, especially the river crossings, you know, just don't put the hotel there. Um, they're putting cabins on these uh, on the islands in the Zambezi River, and they're advertising that you will walk out your porch and see elephants, you know, walk by. But I don't know if the, the message is really getting to the tourists how dangerous they can be. Um, I've seen pictures of a tourist with a selfie stick and is turned around with his back to the bull elephant taking the picture and you know it's just it, it, they're they're not very predictable so so what we do when we go there is we we collect our field data we go out and dart and try to put the collars on but we also we also have at least one afternoon where we invite local people developers um, resource managers groups from ngos the professional hunters and we get together and we talk um, and it is it is very interesting because the park resource managers are saying to the people in the NGOs well you know our our mission is to protect the people who live here and then you know other people are saying well why are you developing and, and enhancing the conflict um, and you can really you can really see the multi multiple perspectives but at least people are talking and we hope that we will provide some data and some maps um, to convince you know people that this is where the elephants this is where they go when it's, there's a dry season or a drought or um, this is what you might expect at the end of the dry season you know so just to try to try to understand what's happening um, and to think ahead with with planning and agriculture and protecting crops so yeah uh, and Ricardo, you have another question. Sure. Um, b before I ask that, uh, I, I was I was thinking about the, the dilemma you were uh, talking about the of releasing information that may be that, that may endanger the, the elephants. Uh, uh, our group uh, we use deep learning to to map segment uh, three species in the in the canopy, and we also think about that because if we mm -hmm. identify on a large scale, like very large trees with economic interest and we release it to the public perhaps we are doing the opposite of our research uh, was like aimed to <laughs> exactly exactly we want to understand it but in any of our geospatial tech technology you know there are, are admirable uses and there are some that are, are not you know yeah. could be used for and so geoethics is so important um, uh, ethical mapping that kind of thing um, you know, in, in fields like archaeology, they have been dealing with this for a long time. So I think we can see what they do, you know, and obviously they add some geospatial uncertainty and that is counterproductive to what we're trying to do. Um, so sometimes I think we may be using our data um, in a more confidential setting, really sharing it with our own researchers and trying to understand and then maybe um, extract some concepts or theories or, or broader um, you know principles that then could be applied maybe without sharing the exact data yeah uh, and, and the question uh, i was uh, intended to ask was uh, i've seen efforts on community driven information to study birds like let lots of uh, these databases do you also use that for the elephants um so I have not so much, but I think Andrea has, and there's actually some websites that just pool all kinds of animal movement data. So that's a really interesting field to get into. Um, so I, I've had some students use the iBird data. Um, so that's, you know, crowdsourced and, and yeah. really interesting. Um, you know, you have to, you have to think a lot about the data. 
is it opportunistic? Is it, um, you know, there's a wide range of expertise in people who are identifying the species, say, um, you know, is there double counting? Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of uh, interesting um, geospatial questions to ask about the data themselves and trying to filter and then really extract the truth, you know, from um, maybe some extra information. Um, but, um, but yeah, we haven't, we haven't gotten into that as much as I think we, we would like to. So, um, and also inter, inter, interspecies interaction. So not just within the elephants, but how are they interacting with, with other wildlife is super interesting. Uh, just, just a minute, okay. in, uh, to take uh, some information about uh, in South Brazil, we have several problems with invasive plants, vegetation. Uh, I don't know the name, uva do Japão, uh, Japanese grape, I don't know. And this species give, give uh, fruit just when the native forest don't offer fruits. Yeah. So the wildlife, wildlife comes to eat it and then they are hunted. This is a big problem in okay. several parts in South Brazil. Oh. Do it invasive vegetation, like, uh, like this Japanese grape vegetation. It's interesting because I think uh, the, the the boundary studies of vegetation can be a proxy to understand the the wildlife hunter process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very, very nice. Oh my goodness! Um, Andrea was looking at um, thinking about spatial cognition of the capuchin monkeys, who are on uh, the black capuchins are in the canopy most of the time. Um, and so she would follow them as best as she could. And it seemed like they had a mental map of when the fruits would, would be coming yeah. in a certain area and they would go there in anticipation. Um, she didn't mention the, the this exotic grape, but um, I can really see how that would also just, um, you know, change the normal patterns of, um, yes. of their foraging. Um, and it's everything from, uh, for example, butterfly gardens that are, are um, introduced here in the United States, trying to give, um, you know, more food for butterflies. And yet, actually, these exotic plants are, are flowering at the wrong times. And now they're not migrating like they should, you know. So the unintentional consequences of people yes. trying to do good things, you know, for wildlife um, also. But... Um, that you know, it, it sounds like that would actually make a an interesting um, experiment, and also you know, looking at um, the drivers, you know, for their their foraging behavior. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Andreas Hernandez, but in fact, this question was made was the first. Uh, if it's yes. possible to identify uh, using remote sensing measure. Um, and we have another question from Veraldo. Veraldo, you want to... Uh, maybe, uh, Fabio, you can read uh, the question from Veraldo, please. Okay, <laughs> sure. Considering that MAPI initiatives are worth for policy issues, what are the current remote sensing perspectives to count and monitor certain key, key tree species important for elephants? Mm. Um, so I, I think, I hope this is what my PhD student, Kate Markham, will be looking at more closely, but it actually, um, it's an interesting area because it, there's, it's savanna for the most part. So the trees yes. are far apart. They, they play a very, very important role in the ecosystem and aggressive elephants will, will go and knock these trees over. And, and in some cases, it doesn't seem to be for food. They're just being aggressive and pounding on these trees until they fall over. Um, so there's been a, a lot of research on that, you know, the, the, the destructive um, impact of elephants on the savanna. Um, and then um, uh, another would be, you know, um, the particular trees that are fruiting at different times, you know, so that is a a, a driver that is bringing the elephants to particular areas, um, the trees that are, are planted in people's yards, you know, that are maybe exotic fruits and things. Um, so, uh, so the, you know, the, the in getting to the species level is very important. One thing I, I have noticed is that el the elephants 
eat everything, anything. So they eat a lot of um, shrubs and leaves and grasses, um, twigs. They have um, you know very um, tough digestive systems. Um, and I and I've seen um, I, I could look at an area and realize this is a this is a shrubby area that has definitely been grazed by elephants. And it's not just elephants. It's you know it's ungulates as well. You know zebra. You know they're all trying to find food at the same time. So, um, so uh, I, I think that at the at the species level would be really important research. And you know with high resolution imagery and drone combined with drone imagery, I think that this is very very possible to do. Um, well. Uh, I think that we not we don't have any more questions from the audience. We, uh, we have another one. Yes, uh, if you have time, I don't know. I will pull back the first question about remote sensing. Uh, sometime, some time ago, I talked to uh, uh, River Enterprise about the use of planet scope yep. data to monitor cattle. Oh, yes. Because I think it's very difficult. Do you think this will be possible? Such resolution, such quality data, like planet uh, data, planet scope data. Uh, yeah. What do you think about? So, um, I have, this is, I have two this is a commercial and is an yes. environmental issue. Yes, yes. Um, so, I have two students who work for Planet now. Um, mm -hmm. So, that's kind of interesting. And um, uh, so uh, I, I do like that the company is willing to work with researchers and provide them with data. Um, it may not be an operational solution because, you know, maybe NGOs cannot afford it or, or government or agencies, but, um, but uh, they have a cooperative um, project right now with the Norwegian government and Airbus. So you might have heard of it, the Norwegian International Climate and Forest Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, so they are providing the ortho mosaics of uh, the planet data uh, available for free, time series yes. data, their, their monthly mosaics of the tropical areas. So, um, so if you just Google the, it's the NICFI. Um, you can find access to that data. It is a 3.7 meter resolution. Um, and so, um, I mean, from my side, I would love to have the less than one meter resolution yes. uh, SkySat satellites, um, but it, it's a start. And, you know, certainly they are imaging the, the world every day. But if you go to look at their images, it's a lot of work to find the cloud free images and stitch them together and, you know, make mosaics. So their, their ortho mosaic products uh, are extremely useful and interesting, I think, for longitudinal studies. Um, so uh, it, that is a, a very exciting area of research. They're cooperating with Google to bring the data into Google Earth Engine. They're also coordinating with Esri. Um, so, you know, incorporating the planet data um, with, um, you know, more and more image processing capabilities of ArcGIS Pro. And then that always moves over into the open source world of QGIS, um, QGIS. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I think that um, that's another reason for us just to be ready to go with, you know, with our automated processing when we have more and more high resolution imagery for these kinds of things. 3.7 3 meters is not enough really to see the elephants. You can definitely see impacts on the landscape. Um, but you know, combining that with maybe more aerial imagery or, or higher spatial resolution imagery for smaller areas, for right now, I, I think that is, um, you know, that is our future. You know, so so hopefully everybody um, can can join them as researchers. Um, you know, they they allow it's, they've changed the amount, but I think it's something like it used to be ten thousand square kilometers. It might be twenty five hundred square kilometers every month maybe that that you could have access to so um, i encourage everybody to try Thanks, that sir. out <laughs> uh, well uh, we can make a, a round of session a round session um, a final round of questions i don't know ricardo if you have another one 
I don't have a question. Just like to comment that uh, it was a very remarkable research that you, you and your group uh, do around there. It's so so brilliant. Like uh, we we studied mostly. I study vegetation and things that are stable, more stable over time, and you track things that are moving and try to understand it. Like it sounds very difficult to do. Uh, oh, but you you have to put the two together. You have to put where people and animals are moving together with what is the vegetation that they're moving and using. So, so it's perfect for yeah. collaboration. <laughs> Maybe we'll be a great partner. That would be awesome. That would be wonderful. And yeah, and about your last comment on, on the amount of data that we ha have nowadays, like planet and, and that, I think that calls back to the, one of the first things you, you said about the visualization and seeing, mm -hmm. believing and understanding, like yeah. to actually visualize the data to make sure you're indeed seeing uh, the phenomena you are mm -hmm. studying mm -hmm. yeah. instead of just trying to put inside a, of a model and, and, and coming with stuff. Yeah. Like yeah, I call it a gut check. Just get a, you know, and, and actually in your modeling process, I, I recommend checking every so often, not waiting until the end, you know, yeah. to look at the product. But, you know, if you start it, look at it and then do a little bit more yeah. and then look at it. You know, I, I just think that that really helps to catch some problems early on. Um, it's just like decoding, you know, when you're programming <laughs> is a good idea, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Sure. Oh, it was uh, my pleasure. Bobby, we want to say... No, just say thank you very, very, very much insights. Your, your, your lecture bring us to very, very much uh, insights that we can apply here in Brazil. I think you can use some ideas, some highlights you, you taught us very nice. Okay. Uh, and about the, the, the comment of Ricardo, uh, we need a double check always, uh, double check and uh, coding, uh, data, statistical approach and a logical approach, make it sense. Always take this in mind, uh, make this sense. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so yes. I just need to, I just uh, can say thanks for your wonderful presentation. Oh. And maybe sometime I can meet you <laughs> in some Congress. And Absolutely. And this COVID goes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. And I hope that, you know, there'll be more ISPRS summer schools. Yeah. And, uh, we have the symposia and the geospatial weeks and the congresses. So, yeah, our fingers are crossed that we'll be able to do that in the future. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, uh, I would like to say thank you for our audience. And a special thank you for you, Marguerite, uh, to share your knowledge with us. was very different that uh, we are uh, working here, but uh, as Ricardo and Fabio to uh, talk, uh, is uh, good insights, uh, good to see different things, and was amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ricardo and Fabio, for sharing with me this round table. Uh, thank you, Margarita, again. Uh, and maybe I talk a uh, pass to Veraldo to finish this session. Well, thank you for having me. And the questions make me think of new, new ways to analyze our data. So thank you to all, everyone. Perfect. In the name of the Brazilian chapter of the Geoscience Remote Sensing Society, I want to acknowledge all actually for our key speaker today, Margaret, and for our committee board, led by Eliana, and also Fabio and Ricardo. Thank you actually a lot. And I just want to invite actually all, let me just show again the flyer, for this uh, Thursday, the lecture with Dyer Sagar about mathematical morphology and processing and analysis of digital elevation models. So stay actually tuned in our program. We will have several lectures and activities like this brilliant webinar today. And all this material is available actually for free so please invite also your colleagues and friends to join our 
event. And again, thank you all actually for supporting our event in this virtual way. And I hope that in near future, we can make it also like hybrid, but also make it presential here in Brazil. And Margaret, I think you have been already in Brazil, but we would like to consider in future to have you attending our events and delivered in person some some of the, the lectures. Oh, I love that. I look forward to it. So with that, I just want to close actually this webinar again, saying thank you for all of you. So see you then okay. next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.